Hey guys, it's Mike from Chess Lifestyle, and today I want to share with you probably the craziest story, uh, craziest chess story of my travels so far. And uh, that is how um, myself, uh, my friend Hakim, and two of his friends, uh, who you'll soon find out all about, uh, managed to come second in uh, a decently strong uh, Team Rapid tournament, uh, and actually led to me getting this medal as well as uh, this trophy. So, uh, yeah, this, <clears throat> this, this whole journey is, is pretty wild, and I wanted to share with you, like, uh, you know, how it all started, how it all went, how it all finished, and all the drama in between. So, yeah, stay tuned uh, for everything uh, to come. So, yeah, basically, um, before I get into any chess, uh, I, want to, I want to tell you a bit more about the team. So, basically... Uh, my, myself and board one, who is taking the photo, uh, was basically um, invited by uh, the board four, who you can see here, uh, which uh, we will call Captain Hakim for the purposes of this uh, video. Uh, and yeah, Hakim was our, our captain, and <clears throat> actually, uh, Hakim was uh, one of the first subscribers to the Chess Lifestyle YouTube. And it's very funny, there's a, there's a video on YouTube of him playing a subscribers match probably around like three, four years ago now. So uh, yeah, like we, we, we didn't really stay in touch, but you know, of course, if, I, if I'm coming to Malaysia, like uh, we had to get in touch and uh, yeah, in short, basically Hakim invited me uh, to a team and um, Hakim also invited two of his friends. So uh, here we have uh, Brandon and here we have Joel. And uh, for, for this video, we'll call Brandon Burger Brandon because uh, Brandon loves burgers. <clears throat> oh, what are they called? Ramly burgers? I think Ramly burgers are like the, the dope uh, Malaysian burgers, which I have to say are, are in, incredible. Um, and uh, Joel will consider us plushy master Joel, because as you can see, like, what is that? <laughs> right? Like, we, we have like a tiny, uh, like squishy plushy for each of us, as well as a huge uh, soft plushie and you know it, it's never crossed my mind uh, I mean I've seen like sometimes like a team mascot like be placed at like one end of a table but to actually have a plushie each like I like when 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 we were discussing on the group chat like uh, before the tournament like what what's gonna happen <clears throat> I think I think someone mentioned like uh, about Joel bringing his plushies I had no idea what to expect but okay I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain um, I, I I took one of the plushies uh, gratefully and uh, yeah, I took I took the chicken, uh, which which you'll see you'll see some photos of later. So um, <clears throat> yeah, basically uh, this was the team. To be honest, I didn't really know much about uh, the strength of my team. I mean, I knew roughly about I knew roughly Hakim's strength, which I would consider probably around like twenty two hundred online on on chess dot com and maybe like twenty three twenty four hundred on Lee Chess. So decent decent player. And the fact that Hakim is going board four means you know. Uh, Brandon and Joel must be pretty decent, but what what I definitely got the vibe of was you know the team was definitely inexperienced, right? Like you know uh, I felt like of, of the four of us chess wise, you know like uh, I've played the most tournaments, played the most games, had the most practical experience, right? So anyway, they 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 put me board board one. I mean I wanted to go board one as well. Like I I really wanted to play as many top players as I could and really challenge myself, right? So. Uh, yeah, that's a very long introduction to the team, but uh, yeah, let, let me let me uh, get into get into the the games now. So <clears throat> the first game, um, our team, uh, which um, I should I should probably mention, is Los Vaqueros. I want to say off the top of my head, I, I think um, it it means the Cowboys in Spanish, and uh, yeah, Hakim has. An origin story of his name, but uh, I won't. I won't go into it. Uh, but yeah, basically, our first round, uh, we were playing down. Um, we were playing a team called the Four Gs. And when I read the Four Gs, I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be like some, you know, like millennial, not millennial. Why am I saying millennial? Like Gen Z, Gen Z, like team of kids." And I wasn't wrong, but uh, it was actually four girls. So I don't know if the 4G stands for the four girls or, like, the actual 4Gs. I don't know. Anyway, nobody cares. Um, the point being is that, yeah, I was playing, like, uh, this, I don't know, 10, 11, 12-year-old girl. Um, and, yeah, I had to think about, okay, what am I going to play with the white pieces? Now, if you've ever played, uh, you know, talented juniors, um, 
you'll probably know that uh, their strongest suit in the majority of cases are their kind of tactical ability. Because basically kids, um, you know, they have a lot of free time and they can get really into something. And if they have grinded like thousands and thousands of puzzles, puzzles then the tactics are going to be pretty sharp, right? So, you know, when, when whoever you're playing, you should always... Well, I mean, okay, you know, teach their own, but I, I like to try and, like, um, you know, play the player a little bit, right? So, basically, uh, what I decided to do was play uh, the Moose C3, which, uh, for anyone who doesn't know... Uh, actually, let me, let me look this up now. Um, there's, there's a chessable course called C3 Venom, which is actually my, my own publication uh, fairly recently. And, uh, yeah, this is all about the move 1C3, uh, and uh, how you can use it as a pretty decent practical weapon, and I've got a whole repertoire on it. But the point is that if they play e5, we get this Karakhan reversed a tempo up, and this is how the game went, right? And uh, I had I had a fairly decent bet that it could go down this path, because, I mean, juniors love to play e5, right? Because, you know, against e4, they're, they're all taught to play e5, so, you know, if they see some weird move, why wouldn't they play e5, right? But the point is I've got a Karakhan reverse the tempo up and uh, by exchanging in the center, um, we actually get this structure, which is very, very funny because this uh, type of position uh, can actually be reached um, from this move order. So from a Queen's Gambit declined, where we get an exchange and we, we get this position and, and this, this type of um, pawn structure here uh, this is called the Carlsberg structure, and it's uh, typical of the Queen's Gambit declined exchange variation. And uh, yeah, in, in this in this position, you know, the the plans uh, are to push um, these pawns forward on on the Queen side, uh, and this is called a minority attack because we're using a minority of pawns against a majority of pawns here. Uh, and uh, for Black, Black is probably going to try and uh, attack uh, our King. Uh, which is going to be on this side of the board. So um, this is kind of like the, the basic strategy of, of the Carlsberg structure. Now, the thing is, um, even though it looks like quite simple, uh, it's actually deceptively complex, this, this structure. And there have been many books and many uh, videos made on this, on this opening, um, which I've consumed a lot of. And uh, my bet is that the majority of juniors probably haven't gotten around to studying the Carlsberg structure. It's kind of one of those like uh, old man chess player kind of activities when they realize that they're flawed at tactics and this is the way they're going to win their games. So uh, I'm, I'm part of that uh, group. And yeah, that's why, um, you know, I really enjoy playing these Carlsberg structures because it's really easy to outplay your opponent once you know the plans and ideas and your opponent doesn't, right? So... I'm playing this girl, uh, we get a Carsford structure, and I'm completely crushing her. Like, I know exactly where all my pieces belong, I can spot when she's making inaccuracies, and eventually the pressure builds up, and I manage to win a piece. Uh, after winning the piece, uh, I manage to win an exchange, which means I'm a rook up. And, you know, I was just, I was just cruising, uh, cruising to victory, and, and we, we, reach, we reach a position uh, like this. And... Um, the last few moves, actually, I think, I think like maybe the position was something like this, where Black uh, attacked my pawn, uh, I, I uh, blocked, uh, blocked, blocked the rook, like from from taking my pawn, and then and then she just moved the rook away. And this was the position I reached, right? And I think at this point, maybe Joel had finished his game already, and he had won. But yeah, at this point, the the, the match hadn't finished by any means, and. I, I want you guys to to have a think actually about uh, yourself here. Like, if this was your position, what, what would be uh, going through your mind? Like, you can even pause the video and have a think what you would play, or like what 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 you'd be thinking about. So the thing is, uh, what I teach my students, and I also try and do for myself, is I really try and lock in. Like, I, I really try and uh, you know not assume the game is over till the game is over, because I mean. It's really true. Like the game is never over till till your opponent resigns or, or there's checkmate on the board, right? And the thing is, uh, there are many factors that led to this, but um, I was extremely relaxed. I was extremely relaxed at this moment because I had played such a class game 
of Carlsberg structure to reach reach this position. Um, I mean, you know, my king safety looks wonderful, right? Like I've got many many escape routes. Like I'm not going to get back rank checkmated. Um, at this tournament, there's also uh, classical music being played very softly in the background, which which was also uh, quite quite refreshing, uh, rather than just you know bone dead silence that some tournaments are like. Um, and as a chess coach, uh, I started to think and imagine what I was going to say to this junior after the game. Because, you know, like, uh, as a junior, you know, back in the day, like, uh, playing chess, I always appreciated when, like, a stronger player would, you know, provide some advice for me about, like, what went wrong or, like, uh, you know, g- give me some insights, right? So... You know, naturally, I, I, I'm thinking of, like, oh, what, what advice I should give this girl. And I realized, like, the two mistakes that she made, um, where she blundered a piece and blundered an exchange, both of these moves were actually my first instinct in the position. I wholeheartedly believe they were, like, the most natural moves in the position. But they both blunder due to, like, some concrete tactical combination. I mean, in the morning of this uh, event, I also trained some tactics, so I was definitely feeling sharp, like, this, this morning when I played. So... Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to give her a piece of advice, which uh, is from the world champion Emmanuel Lasca. And he, he said, I, I don't know if this is a quote exactly, but it was something along these lines. It was basically like, um, the most natural moves in a chess game are the moves you should be most careful about. So... This is very useful advice, right? Because, I mean, with, with natural moves, like, you know, you, you kind of just want to play intuitively and you don't need to think because it's so natural. But actually, because they're so natural and because they're so intuitive, you start to get lazy and you don't actually look at them properly and then you're prone to making mistakes, right? So I was thinking like, oh, I'm such a good chess coach. This is, this is like such a good piece of advice for this girl because it's exactly applicable to a play. And as I'm thinking of this, I, I just grab another pawn because I was like, well... You know, I'll grab this pawn, I'll start pushing this pawn down the board. Uh, you know, well, what's, what's wrong with this? And as soon as I captured a pawn and pressed the clock, and I looked at the position, probably some of you who are a little bit stronger already know exactly what I'm going to say. But I suddenly realized I had made an absolutely horrendous, horrendous blunder in this position. And the thing is, at this moment... Um, I don't know, like, let, let's, let, let me explain what, what the blunder is, first of all. Well, first of all. So, so the blunder is the fact that my opponent has now got her king trapped. Her pawns are now stuck. She only has a rook left. And that means if she can get rid of her rook, then the position is a stalemate. It's a draw, right? And what's the most horrific thing about this position is it looks like my king has so much space uh, to run, Right? But in fact, these pawns are completely covering the escape routes. And because this rook can check from these two squares, you can see that this, this whole area is just completely, like, entombed. There, there's no escape here. So I, I, I realized this in, like, half a second, that I'm completely screwed in this position. But I had to keep a poker face, right? It's either that or I get up from the board, but I mean in a rapid play game where I haven't got up from the board a single time, I mean getting up from the board is like probably equally as suspicious as having some big reaction. So I was just completely calm. Like I, I was just completely relaxed. And uh, in this position, she gave a check and I wasn't sure if she'd seen it at this, at this point, but I decided just to play the most, like just a very calm move, like, you know, just get my king to safety and hope that maybe she plays a move like rook b1 or something, to try and go after my pawn, like a very natural move to chase after pawn. Like, this is maybe a move you'd play if you'd missed the idea. Because, I mean, I was in two minds at this point, in all honesty, because I was thinking whether to go king e2, uh, because if she starts checking me from this side, this would actually be very careless, right? Because I could keep running away, and eventually... um, yeah, I mean, I, I could come up, I could come up this way as well, and 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 I think I can escape these checks uh, eventually. Like, eventually, I'm going to be able to get in the way of of my my rooks, and I, and I don't care basically if um if if I lose a rook, right? Because I, I'm still one rook up. So so I mean, I had some ideas of like, oh, should I try run this way? Maybe my opponent um 
will, will mess up like this. But the problem is, I thought maybe she might just give a check like this, and maybe at this moment she would realize that she can get rid of the rook, right? So, I mean, I, I had no idea like what was my best, my best try, practically speaking. Uh, but in the end, I decided to go king g2, and unfortunately, yeah, not not this move, obviously. Oh my god, uh, yeah, rook g1 was was played, and and here, you know, I I, I I you know just play another move. You never know, but of course, yeah, she she knows what to do, and I just had to agree a draw. So basically, this you know, like the morning of the stream, uh, like like the morning of the event, I, I streamed. And I was really fired up. Like, uh, I had some external stuff going on that, like, uh, caused me to be, like, super pumped up. And, <laughs> like, I don't know. I think, I think, like, a few years ago, probably, like, uh, messing up a game like this would have really, really got to me. And, I mean, in fairness, I think if, if this happened nowadays and it was, like, a classical FIDE standard match, I think this would also have completely uh, destroyed me to, to mess up like this. Uh, but also in, like, a classical standard match, I think I would be more careful. Like, I, I don't think I would be as relaxed as I was, right? So I, I think, like, you know, it's... it's I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not so worried, basically. And, and the thing is, what I'm very proud of was, like, at, at this moment, like, I wasn't, you know, on the brink of tilting, right? Like, I, I think, like, a few years ago, I would have been. But it, it was kind of just, like, I had to just laugh, right? Like, like just, you know, like, what are the chances that my exact advice, right, the Laska quote, like, the most natural moves are the moves you have to be most careful about. As I'm thinking of this quote and thinking of how to word this to this girl, I literally grab a pawn, which is just, like, a natural move, and, and suddenly I'm completely screwed, right? So, yeah, uh, this, this happened, uh, you know, uh, I think my teammates saw this live and, and uh, were laughing at me as well. And I mean, like, you know, like... I, I can't imagine what these guys must have been thinking at first. Like, they're like, oh, you know, this, this 2,000 washed player from the UK, like, can't even uh, convert a rook up position. Like, I, I have no idea because this, these are, like, first impressions, right? But, uh, yeah, basically, uh, the rest of the teammates won. We won three and a half half. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was time for round, uh, round two. And uh, there was a little funny moment here as well, which I'll share, but... Uh, you, you may have heard that, uh, you know, like with any kind of chess tournaments, they use like Swiss pairings. And this can be for individual or team events. And the point is that, uh, yeah, if you win your first round, you play someone else who won. Draw your first round, you play someone who drew. Lose your first round, you play someone you lose. And then, you know, as the tournament goes on round two, you know, you'd, you'd end up... Uh, if you win your round two and you won your round one, then you'd play someone else who has won their first two rounds and, you know, so on. You, you play people who are on the same points. Uh, and the thing is with, with team tournaments, uh, because game points are, are relevant too, uh, you can win a match 4-0, 3.5-half, 3-1, 2.5, 1.5, right? Um, I believe the Swiss pairings also work in the same way, in the sense that they will pair players, pair, pair teams that have won 4-0 against each other. So I was telling my teammates, like, you know, guys, guys, just don't worry about it. Like, uh, actually scoring 3.5-half half is actually, like, a good thing. Uh, we'll get paired against a slightly weaker team. And uh, this... You know, every every uh, win win counts. So so this is actually probably some uh, some good tactics, right? Um, so uh, we, we we sit down for for our second round, and we're paired against a team that's like similarly rated to us. So my prediction was was correct. But just before we start the round, uh, the announcers say, "Oh, um, sorry, everyone, we made a mistake in the pairings." <laughs> so they redo the pairings, and when these new pairings come out, uh, we find out that we're actually playing top top seed. <laughs> so. Don't ask me how that, that happened. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't look into exactly uh, how and why that happened. But yeah, round two was suddenly playing, playing the, the top seeds. And, and this top seed, uh, this team, uh, they have FIDE Master on board three. Actually, uh, Ivan, uh, who's going to get a little shout out later uh, because he's got his own uh, Malaysian chess uh, YouTube channel. Uh, but uh, yeah, he's a FIDE Master of like 2300, 2350 strength. And yeah, he's pushing for IM. He was on board three. Like, sorry, what? <laughs> uh, you know, like, th this is a team we're having to play. So uh, we played them. And, uh, oh, man, I don't think I've got any footage of this game. But ba basically, um, uh, I I'm playing the board one, uh, who's also a FIDE master. Um, it's a very close Benoni game, but I end up losing it. Like, I think I had really good control of the game. And I basically played two mistakes that kind of... Um, 
Well, one of the mistakes was like uh, he he just sacrificed an exchange because he kind of had to. Like I was basically taking over in the position, so he had to play something dynamic. And upon sacrificing the exchange, again, I played the most natural move in the position and I missed a tactic. And I felt so annoyed because the whole game I was being so careful and then I suddenly played a quick move and of course the quick move backfired. So uh, this, was, uh, this was the first mistake. And then the second mistake was I had a chance to defend much more tenaciously and I just played another quick move that meant that he had a much easier way to attack and then, and then I was lost. So, you know, you make two mistakes against an FM, expect to lose, basically. Um, so that was the first thing. Uh, board two and board four also, also lost. I, I assume they just got outplayed. Uh, but board three, uh, if you remember, right, we got Plushy Master Joel on board three. Um, he had uh, played a fantastic game. He was uh, winning, winning the game. And he managed to even convert it to an end game. But was completely and utterly winning, right? Like Plushy Master Joel, uh, he had, um, I want to say he had like a rook, knight, and a bishop, and a few pawns. I even remember he had like connected past pawns, right? Literally just free to roam on the queen side. Uh, and his opponent only had a bishop and like maybe three pawns. So rook, knight, and bishop, and four pawns against like bishop and three pawns. Something, something like this. And... You know, obviously from a positional uh, point of view, like obviously Joel would win 100 times out of 100. Uh, but okay, feel free to pause the video and think what other factor might, might be relevant here, like to, to decide the result. And basically, uh, yeah, the other factor must be time, right? And yeah, I haven't mentioned yet, but the, the tournament was a 20 plus zero. And I'm actually super glad that the tournament was 20 plus zero in general, which we'll, we'll come back to later. But um, yeah, I mean, at the start of the event, they were actually taking a vote to see if uh, people wanted to play with increment. And I, was, I have raised my hand for that 20-0 because, you know, uh, I think it's much, much more fun without, without increment. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, so 20-0 so was, was chosen. And uh, okay, time was a factor. Now, in this game between Joel and this Fide Master, uh, Joel had only 51 seconds left on the clock. But if you can believe... Ivan, the FM, had 21 seconds on the clock. So let's remind ourselves, Joe is like completely winning in this position. He's got an extra 30 seconds on the clock in a situation where both sides are below a minute. And this is what ends up happening, right? Okay, let me, let me, even, let me even get a, get a, get a chess piece to, to demonstrate uh, this, this effect, right? So basically, uh, Joe would be, would be thinking and thinking, and you know, He'd make the move, press the clock, and his opponent, Ivan, bang, bang, right? He would, he would slam, slam the move, press the clock instantly. And again, it would come to Joe's, Joel's turn. And Joe's like scratching his chin. Mm, mm, mm. Makes the move, positions it perfectly, press the clock. And Ivan's like, bang, right? Like instantly making a move. And I'm watching from behind. And I'm losing my mind here because Ivan is not... His clock isn't going down because he's playing so quickly. And Joel is burning like five seconds a move. So, you know, six, seven moves later, they're going to have the same amount of time. And there is absolutely no reason to, like, not play faster because, I mean, literally Ivan only has a bishop. I mean, okay, he had, like, one pass pawn, which you could sack any of your pieces for or you could block it, like, literally anything. And Joel was, like, taking forever. So what ends up happening is, like, uh, Joel doesn't speed up. He doesn't speed up, and it gets down to, like, 15 seconds each. And only then <laughs> does, does uh, Joel speed up. Uh, and the problem is, Ivan's just a faster player. And Joel runs out of time. Now, the very good news is that with just, like, maybe two, three seconds on the clock, uh, Joel managed to capture Ivan's bishop. Uh, because if, if Joel hadn't captured that bishop, um, then I think he would even lose, right? Technically speaking, if, if one side has a king and bishop and the other side has other pieces, even though the king and bishop would never in reality actually be able to checkmate, I mean, from a theoretical standpoint, if it can, then the win is awarded to the side who didn't flack, right? So thankfully, at least it was only a draw, not, not a loss, but yeah, Joel was devastated after that. I think 
uh, Hakeem and Brandon were also in low spirits uh, for for losing that game. Um, but yeah, okay. I mean, it's it's a long long event. We we got to pick ourselves back up. So so the next round uh, came came about, and you know, uh, like. I remember at some point I gave some kind of pep talk. I, I think that maybe it came later, but basically at this moment, you know, like we we had to lock in, we had to we had to fight. Like we, we couldn't just you know, um, you know, tilt at this point. So uh, we played this third round and we managed to win. Um, actually, actually, the game I played, uh, it, it's really cool actually because I, I I've recently been reflecting a lot on like a repertoire against the Reti and English. And I've come to some conclusions about certain move orders to get favorable uh, types of positions. And I managed to use some of this recent uh, research to basically get me a winning position after like 10 moves. So, so this was very, very uh, satisfying. And, and yeah, I managed to convert the position and, and win, right? So I managed to win. Uh, I think um, Brandon and Joel managed to win as well. And I, I think Hakeem lost again. So this is the thing. Uh, going into the lunch break now at this moment, um, Basically, uh, Brandon Brandon was chilling. Like you know, Brandon was like uh, like before the event. He was saying like you know he's he's always played board two. This is this is where he feels at home. And yeah, okay, two out of three, only losing to a fide master. You know, can't 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 complain too much. So I think Brandon was feeling alright. Um, Plushy master Joel, uh, I think, was still licking his wounds over the fact that he managed to lose on time in a situation that was like unlosable. Um, and after eating my lunch, I, I came back to the playing hall. We still had like an hour left. I ended up like sparring with Joel. Like, I don't know how many games we played, like at least five, at least five games, maybe even more of positions where, um, I, I would, we would both give ourselves like two minutes on the clock and, uh, Joel would have a slightly better position and Joel would need to convert the position. And I mean, in fairness, some of these positions were actually from, games that we would play from the starting position where Joel literally just outplayed me, played better chess, got to these winning positions, but then would manage to either choke or like play too slowly and, and lose somehow, right? So we, we were just practicing with this no increment, just, just trying to improve Joel's speed and conversion rate. And, and I asked Joel, like, you know, like you're playing some fantastic chess, like, like, like what are your online ratings? And he tells me he has 2,600 bullet. And I'm like, what? Like, how can you have 2,600 bullets and then, you know, you're, you're playing so slowly, right? So basically, I think it's just a mindset thing. It's a confidence thing of just not feeling like, you know, you can play quickly. Or I, I don't know what it was, but for whatever reason, you know, we, we did a lot of practice and I think it genuinely improved. Now, uh, moving on from board three, we have board four Captain Hakeem. He's feeling really miserable about his chess because, like, you know, he's, he's lost two games uh, in a row and... Um, I think Hakeem's issue as a player, right now at least, is probably just the kind of like emotional resilience that you need to be a strong tournament player. And this comes with a lot of experience and practice. Like I, I mean, some people are lucky enough to be born with it, but I certainly wasn't. And it took a lot of experience to get to a point where I am now. But uh, yeah, no, I think Hakeem was uh, struggling a bit. And I, and I mean, like, I think it was either after this round three or round four, uh, because spoiler, uh, Hakeem lost round four as well. And and I remember, um, I think like one of the games, at least he, he was uh, definitely better. And, and then he managed to choke uh, in the conversion and, and lose. And I had the feeling that, you know, like Hakeem had a lot of pressure on his shoulders because, you know, it's a team event. He has the best board in the sense that he's board four. I mean, the four of us are probably not too dissimilar in terms of strength. But he's playing on board four, so he feels like, I don't know, I guess like some, some pressure to win, like make, make it count. Otherwise, why is he on board four? Like he should put me on board four or something and, and ensure that we get those wins, right? So, so he's got some pressure on his shoulders. Um, and he's lost three in a row, right? And, and, I, and I think, uh, yeah, in, in like, when, when, when like examining this situation, uh, I got reminded of... Uh, uh, a Davrin uh, Kuyasevich quote, uh, Grandmaster Davrin Kuyasevich, the guy, the guy who wrote How to Train Chess on Your Own. And, and he said, um, when you are converting a position and you're starting to feel the stress, like you, you, you feel that maybe like, oh, maybe the team needs to win, maybe like uh, uh, you've been playing so well, you have to convert this, you can't lose this position. Like, I don't know, all of these kind of thoughts, right? 
you need to shut them all out and think of just two things. The first thing is you need to focus on the position and what move you're going to play. Like ultimately, in reality, nothing actually matters except for what is the next move you're going to play and what is the next move you're going to play after that and what is the next move you're going to play after that. Like that's all that's going to determine who wins this game, right? So the position itself, that's the number one thing. The second thing that you should focus on is your breathing. And when I heard this, it had never crossed my mind to think about breathing in a chess game. Like, uh, like you know, you don't think about breathing. It's like a subconscious thing. But when you actually think about it during a game and you force yourself to take some deep breaths, it has a calming effect. And when you're stressing out and you're not able to, you know, play good chess because you've got all this pressure, you need to calm yourself down. And actually the breathing, really effective. Really, really effective. So, yeah, basically I told Hakeem to focus on these two things. And uh, you'll see uh, how, how Hakeem turned turn things around. I mean, of course, this isn't the only factor, but I think, like, you know, having, like, uh, some, some motivation and some, something to focus on uh, to try and, like, uh, make a recovery, I mean, I think this is useful, right? So, uh, the lunch break is over. Uh, we, we get uh, into round four. And we're playing another team that's kind of similar level to us. Uh, and we managed to beat them again. So at this moment, we're, we're on three out of four. And, uh, you know, this is already better than our expectations, right? Because, I mean, I feel like the top three or four teams in, in the event had, like, at least two titled players per team. Uh, so they're, they're pretty strong, right? Uh, but we're sitting on three out of four. And we're expecting now, okay, now it's going to get tough. These final two rounds, we're going to play some really strong guys. And it turns out that, I guess because, you know, we had that up float earlier in the tournament in round two, we now were blessed with a down float. And what I mean by a down float is that we were playing a team that was on slightly worse points than us. And to our surprise, this team actually had an average rating lower than ours. Now, okay, they're, they're clearly underrated because, you know, they're also having a great event. I think they're on two and a half out of four. So two wins, a draw and a loss. Um, but we were like, okay, this is a big chance. This is a big, big chance. And we played them. And I have to say, this, this guy I played on board one, um, he had a Chinese, Chinese name. I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, it began with a Z. <laughs> uh, I apologize for not remembering exactly. Um, but he was fantastic. Like, I, I played some uh, Seafree Venom uh, main like very let, let me even let me see if I can remember the game just from from memory and and, and this is also why actually like uh, you know creating opening courses or even just building your own raptor is very useful for just remembering uh, no he played knight f6 first um, for remembering remembering theory and the other thing as well is a really cool thing about uh, studying um, an opening like the London but actually knowing theory is that most London players don't know theory. They don't know the critical lines. And that means black actually gets into a false sense of security because black generally doesn't get tested because white isn't testing them. But the C3 Venom course, which I made, like, you know, I, I'm playing, like, extremely critical stuff, uh, but also very strategical, um, strategical based play. Like, I'm not trying to get you to remember exact moves and whatever. But, okay, the, the line that actually comes up is kind of very concrete. Uh, he plays the modern main line of uh, bishop f5. I meet this with queen b3. Um, and he plays queen c8 here. And, and I mean, the, the, main, the main line in, in, the, in the London here is to simply just develop your pieces. You get uh, kicked back. And black goes for the strategy of, like, pushing, pushing the pawns on the queen side. You need to break on e4. And I don't like these positions at all. I feel like black gets way too much play. And I'm not so convinced with my, with my counterplay in the center when black has such a huge grip uh, on the square. So, um, basically, Stockfish 16 uh, actually helped me uh, kind of look into this move. And, and I, I don't think, like, maybe some top players have played this now. Yeah, 13 games. But C4 is actually, is actually the, the, the top game, uh, the top uh, engine move. It's like, you know, it's equal, plus 0.1 or something. It's, it's nothing special. But the logic is this. I mean, it looks like we've got a very similar position where black has just got an extra piece developed. Uh, but... There are two little aspects. One is that the queen is slightly better placed than c8. And actually, the queen on c8 is a little bit vulnerable to tactics on c1. Um, 
And in this position, there are many, many ways for black to go wrong. For instance, taking this pawn is already like plus 1.5 or something. I think we capture here with tempo on the knight. And um, yeah, this, this ends up um, leading to an advantage uh, for white. Um, we, we even allow them to capture here. And I think uh, we take back of the pawn. And, and I don't know, there's, 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 a, there's a long line here, which um, yeah, we're getting to right now. But the move he played in the game was take some c4. I take back with the bishop, threatening f7. He then plays e6, a very natural move. And here, I develop the knight. Uh, the idea is that they, they take here. And uh, the best move, you, you might think, is take with the pawn, because we're going to get an isolated pawn anyway. And in general, the principle is you want to keep as many uh, minor pieces on the board when you play with an isolated queen's pawn. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, engine says to take with a knight. So take with a knight. And the reason why, actually, is because you're trying to exploit the fact that this king is still a bit... Uh, exposed and hasn't castled yet. Um, and that is why putting pressure on this knight on c6 is good. I mean, if, if they take back of the pawn, their structure is ruined. If they take back of the queen, we win the game. And if they take, then the king is a bit exposed, right? So they need to take. Um, we take back. And now they have to play a6. Because if they don't play a6, we're going to play bishop b5, and it, it, it gets horrible again. Um, and in this position, uh, I castle. Um, and I believe... Yeah, bishop e7, I think, I think is, is the natural move. I then play rook fc1, and you're going to see why I put the rook on uh, c1. And in this position, to avoid uh, some nasty discoveries, right? Uh, black needs to move the queen uh, out the way, and d7 is the most natural square. Um, and the point is I play bishop f1 here, because uh, I seem to remember that after they take on d4, the point is that I take on b7. And, um, you know, again, black has problems with castling because the bishop on e7 is going to hang. So, so the pawn is actually uh, untouchable right now. Um, and I think at this moment, I want to say my, my, my course uh, gives this uh, castling, which I believe is the best move. And I believe that my correct move here is knight c4. And the point is that uh, not only do I have a threat of knight b6, I also have a threat of just bringing my knight into e5. The pawn is very often uh, a little bit uh, dodgy to take. And okay, the position is like plus 0.1. So it's, it's nothing special, but, but white has a little bit more play, and black can still go wrong. So, okay, I, I mean, like, I, I'm, in, I'm in 14 moves of theory, and it's actually at this moment where my opponent deviates uh, from the theory. And the crazy thing here is actually I've looked at this line afterwards and, and the reason why this isn't actually as good, this is like maybe plus 0.3, plus 0.4, is because white can play this tremendous move knight c4. And the idea is that you can give up this bishop uh, and this might even be stronger than plus 0.4. I think, I think this is like already white is uh, doing really well here, right? Because yeah, the, this king is not castled and it's just a bit too slow. So uh, I, I didn't see this in the game, obviously, and, and I don't think you can play such a move in, in like... Uh, rapid when, when you've got such a simple move like bishop g3, which, which seems reasonable enough. Like, you're, you're out of book, you have to uh, play like this. And, and okay, the, the game goes on. I mean, actually, I think uh, my opponent kind of messed up here because, again, he should just castle his king, right? But you, you get these, uh, like, you get this with, with juniors who are very talented that they, they, they get too invested in, like, some tactical idea that they see. And my guy plays bishop g5. And I think this is his biggest mistake of the game because although objectively it's, it's fine, it allows me to play knight c4. And even though this posi position is still zeros, I mean, this is just a complete mess, right? Knight, knight d6 and um, yeah, we, we get this position. And, you know, I've got all these ideas of like, like queen e3, uh, trying to bring the rook into c7. Um, and in the end, uh, I, ma I managed to win this game. Um, and actually, uh, it, it was also a very interesting situation because uh, my, my opponent had found a combination later in the game, but he touched the wrong piece first. He touched his queen when he shouldn't have. And as a result, that meant he would need to move his queen, and the position was such that he would need to use the queen uh, to move to a square where it can get taken, which means that he just loses instantly, right? And um, when, he, when he touched his queen... Uh, he was going to try and move a different piece, so I just stopped the clocks and raised my hand. And the arbiter came over, and I was like, yeah, he touched his queen, he has to block, block the check. And, and then he realized, and, and yeah, he just resigned on the spot. And he told me after the game that what, uh, the reason why he didn't, uh, you know, like, uh, accept that he had to move the queen was because he forgot that he can actually move the queen to block the check. I think the position was a check or something, so he had to, had to block the check or something. Uh, so he thought that, you know, 
uh, because he can't move the queen anywhere, uh, then he, he has the right to move a different piece. And because, like, I already uh, prevented him from moving the queen uh, before he pressed the clock, then it's not an illegal move yet. Anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter all the logistics. The point is, yeah, I managed to win this game. And again, having some very concrete uh, theoretical knowledge uh, always always is uh, a bit of an asset. But, you know, this guy played a, played a great game in, in some ways. I mean, like, his, his rating was, like, 1,600. And, yeah, like, for the first 13 moves of the game, he's literally playing, like, Stockfish 16 in a position that... He's completely out of book after C4, right? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, res- respect to him. But incredibly, uh, this, this underrated team that's doing really, really well, our guys managed to pull off a 4-0 win. So <clears throat> going into the final round, round six, we are, we are sitting on four out of five. And we're, like, getting a bit hyped at this point because we're like, well, you know, if we win the final round might have a chance to win the whole thing, you know? But we're like, of course, you know, we're going to be playing one of the top, top teams now. And, of course, yeah, we get put on top board and we are playing uh, this team uh, of, of juniors, these uh, prodigious juniors, and they're actually leading the event. Now, they're on uh, four and a half out of five. Uh, they draw another one of the teams of title players and they actually beat uh, the team that we lost to. They beat the, the team with... Ivan, the Fide Master on board three. Uh, yeah, they managed to beat them. So this was definitely going to be like the toughest team uh, of the event. And uh, yeah, basically, um, uh, you know, we, we, we sit down to play. And uh, I am uh, going to play uh, a junior called Kevin Mohan. And, you know, I, I don't know who, who Kevin is. I don't know any of like the, the local players or whatever. And I'm getting all kinds of people come up to me uh, trying to tell me how amazing this, this player is. And I'm just telling all of them to shut up. Like, piss off, go away. Because I don't want to know. I don't want to know who this player is. I don't want to feel psyched out by the fact that this guy is like some god. I mean, from the way that people are hyping, up, if I, hyping him up, if I had to make a guess, like I would have assumed he was like an IM or something, right? So I don't even want to think about these thoughts. I, don't, I just want to... Uh, lock in, play the best game of chess I can and, and not get uh, psychologically affected. I mean, basically you know, if I'm playing like a junior like my, my first round opponent where I feel like, you know, maybe I can get some practical advantage by actually thinking about the opponent, then I'll do it. But when you're playing a player who's this strong you don't want to get, you don't want to get any, you don't want to feel any fear. I think as soon as you lose it, your confidence and you start to fear, it will affect your play. So I wanted to go into this game as confident as possible. And I managed it, right? I managed to shut out anything. I didn't know how strong this player was. I didn't know what titles he had. I just knew it was good. And that meant I needed to lock in and play my absolute best chess. Now, one thing to add is that uh, in all of these rounds, you know, we've been holding these plushies. And there's just this hilarious video. Uh, shout out to Ellie who uh, f- filmed this. But just, just, this, is, this, is the, this is the kind of... Um, kind of emotional support that these uh, plushies <laughs> were able to give us. Uh, so yeah, I found that funny. This is actually uh, our team playing this, uh, this, this final round. Um, and yeah, I was, I was playing this, uh, this kid, uh, 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 Kevin Moha, right? Uh, which is now on YouTube, uh, for the record. And, and if, you, if you look up uh, Malaysian Chess, uh, you'll find uh, the YouTube channel uh, that shows this game, and you can, you can watch the game in full. Uh, but... Yeah, basically what ended up happening was uh, Kevin played uh, 1d4, I played knight f6, they played c4. And uh, yeah, let me actually show you the position. So um, basically uh, we, we get, get this position. And for the record, I actually find out that afterwards he, he's, he's, a, he's a Verisov player. And I think I really would have struggled had, had, he, had he played uh, the Verisov. I mean, I have some prep against Tromposki and I reckon it could be somewhat relevant to the Verisov. So I don't think I would have got smashed, but... It, I mean, definitely I wouldn't have been as happy as getting a mainline Benoni because, I mean, this is the thing, right? Like, uh, in, especially in Rapid, uh, the shorter the time control and the weaker the players, the less objective, ob- objectivity matters, right? And Benoni is definitely a slightly dubious opening in the sense that, you know, you can't play it at a very elite level. But anything below that, I think it's definitely fine. And the thing is, I've got, like, 15 years of experience playing, playing the Benoni. 
and that, that's led to a lot of lot of understanding and nuance. And uh, basically, my, my opponent went into this like mainline um, mainline Benoni with bishop b five. This is the most critical test, the strongest engine line that uh, a player with the white side can go into. But on the same, at the same time, the, the positions are very tricky, and you really need to know a lot if you want to if you want to play it. And the thing is, I think uh, Kevin, unfortunately for him, was kind of freestyling it a bit. Like he knew some theory, but he didn't necessarily understand why he was playing this theory. And uh, this was actually the first time where things had gone wrong for him, because uh, basically in a Benoni, uh, one of the most fundamental strategical aspects you've got to realize is that you have a space disadvantage. Now. It's interesting because space disadvantage sounds like a negative thing, right? Disadvantages are normally negatives. But in fact, a space disadvantage is actually not a negative at all if you don't have uh, an overwhelming number of pieces. In the sense that if you were to trade one of these minor pieces off the board, but you, you note that I'm not touching this bishop because... Uh, this bishop is, is super, super strong, and we should only trade this bishop in exceptional circumstances. And actually, you'll find out in the game that I end up uh, trading this bishop, but this is for very specific reasons in terms of like converting the position cleanly, so not to do with like the Benoni uh, in general. Uh, but the point is, if I can trade one of these pieces, I have one less piece to maneuver in my limited amount of space. And uh, well, what I teach my students is that I, I really like to use this analogy of uh, an elevator, a lift, right? And uh, if you imagine, like, you get into a lift, you're probably chilling, right? Like, there's a lot of space. But if you get into a lift, and your friends get into the lift, and your parents get into the lift, and I like to use some random fictitious character called Uncle Jerry gets into the lift, who's, you know, uh, eaten a few too many buffets and is a little bit overweight, um, you're going to start feeling uncomfortable, right? And the solution to this problem is you simply kick Uncle Jerry out of the lift and force him to take the steps. And if you do that, well then, you know, uh, suddenly the lift is feeling uh, completely okay again. And it's the same as this. Like, right now, we have a little bit of a space disadvantage. Trade one of these pieces, and the position will flow very nicely. And in this position, after hitting the bishop, I think Kevin should accept that, you know, either he puts the bishop on b3, or he accepts that he should have put the bishop on e2 in the first place. But no, he puts the bishop on a2. And actually, it is, uh, like, unfortunately, in, in, the, in the YouTube video, um, you, you missed my reaction because, I mean, yeah, uh, Ivan wants to make the, the video short and snappy and, and, you know, cuts out the long thinking time. But I remember I had, I had a real reaction to this, to this move. I mean, I mean, I think you just about catch the start of my reaction. But I was just thinking, like, what, what the hell is this move? Like, this isn't a good move. And I was just thinking, because he was playing so quickly, I was wondering, like, is this some, like, deep theory? Is, has he got some deep understanding here that I don't have? And he's understood that bishop a2 is actually a good move under exceptional circumstances. But I kept looking and I kept looking and I was like, I don't see it. I don't see why this is, this is a good move. So obviously I'm just going to trade a minor piece. And at this moment, uh, white does not have the time to play h3, which means I can even trade another minor piece. And now my position is just equal. See, I've already equalized. And it's very, very easy to equalize in the Benoni if your opponent doesn't understand the strategy of the Benoni, right? So... Uh, I just castle, right? Like, uh, you know, very, very natural. And uh, at this moment, my opponent plays bishop e3. Again, very natural move developing a piece. Now, the idea behind this move is to play the move bishop e3, bishop f2, and bishop g3. And the idea of this is that I don't know what the rook is doing here. Probably he'll, he'll try and play b3 if his knight is secure enough, which it probably it will be. Get everything off this diagonal. Swing the rook over to e2 with the bishop on... Uh, um, e3 and then try, try and make this uh, e4, e5 break. And either with the idea that he wants to take back, or maybe after I take, he wants to try and push. Maybe he wants to try and uh, push here, and, and then try and bring a knight in, or, or something like this. Th this is probably the plan. Of course, he's already traded two minor pieces, so this plan is going to be less effective anyway, but probably this is what he's hoping for. And as a result, I played quite quickly before he could change his mind the move knight c4. But not so quickly but he gets suspicious that he might have missed something. So you've got to find that middle ground, right? So I play the move knight c4, and you might think that a player like Kevin, Kevin Mohan is never going to make a blunder, but given the circumstances, given the timing of my move knight c4, and given the fact that he's got this plan to put the bishop on g3, he instantly played bishop f2. And I think, guys, you can even find the move yourself. If you uh, want to try to find it, you can pause the video. But knight d2.
right? Simple fork. And at this moment, when I played the move 92, I really emphasized, like, slamming the clock um, to really, like, you know, like, uh, make some psychological impact on, 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 on this game. Like, I have outplayed you. I have literally just won an exchange. You've been blitzing out the moves because you feel like you're confident. And now you're going to lose. And I wanted to make this, this point loud and clear uh, because, I mean, like, yeah, this, this um, you know, if, if my opponent is going to tilt at the board, then that's going to give me extra chances, right? So, uh, yeah, not only this, uh, it's, quite, it's quite funny that, uh, I mean, we can actually, we can actually uh, bring it up on, uh, on the board. So, yeah, you can see I wait a bit. I played knight c4. And then... Oh, there, there's no sound. I wish, I, wish there was, I wish there was sound on this. Let me, let me see if I can um, get this. All right. Yeah, let's go. Let's go one more time. Yeah, and you can see that uh, everyone... Okay. Uh, everyone, everyone turns around. Like, like, you can see the board three... Uh, the board two eventually turns around. I think he's not turning around because Kevin is looking straight at him. Uh, and I've actually got another camera angle of, of, of Kevin's reaction here, which is absolutely distraught by the fact that he's missed this. Um, but yeah, the point is, I managed to get away, with this, get away with this fork. But at this moment, my mentality changed 100%. Because now that I've won, uh, I think he played uh, queen d3 actually and took with the king. But now that I've won the exchange, all that matters is that I convert this position cleanly. Like, being able to play with confidence, being able to, you know, make use of these psychological tricks, this isn't going to be the most important thing anymore. The most important thing is that I actually play good chess and convert this position. So, uh, I uh, recommend you finish watching the video because it's, it's, it's quite entertaining and, and I, I'm really proud of, like, how I converted the position because there are many moments where Kevin would be, like, offering me uh, a piece or maybe uh, even a whole rook, uh, but if I take it, then I allow some counterplay. And I knew, like, this kid is strong, right? He's got resources, he's got tactics. And all I had to do was just shut down the game and make sure he doesn't have any opportunity to fight back. And I managed to pull it off. So at this moment, right, I've, I, I've managed to pull off uh, a win against this, uh, against this kid. And, and you know, the, the game finished pretty early. So all, all, all three boards were still playing. And at this moment, I come to take a look at uh, the other boards. Now, I take a look at Brandon's game, Burger Brandon. And unfortunately for Brandon, he's got a very, very tough position. It, it looks like a French winner uh, where he's on the white side. It looks like he's been strategically outplayed. It looks like he's under huge amounts of pressure. And the problem is he's also got like two minutes uh, to his opponent's like 10 minutes. So this game, I already felt like was definitely uh, going pear-shaped and unless a stroke of a miracle happens, he's going to lose this game. I then check at board three, and there's a very interesting imbalance on the board because basically uh, um, Plushy Master Joel has uh, like a queen, rook, and a bishop, and like a couple pawns against his opponent's queen, rook, and four pawns. So I think he's got a piece for two pawns, but it's like, you know, getting close to an endgame. And the problem is his king is quite weak. So... Again, could go anyway, and also the time situation, I think both sides had around a similar amount of time left, maybe like five minutes each on the clock. I then checked board four, and again, the position is completely crazy. I have no idea who's better. And uh, yeah, both sides also have around five minutes each. So at this moment, okay, I'm, I'm getting uh, you know, uh, quite nervous, and, and it's quite funny actually because I was like watching, and an arbiter comes over to me and says, you know, when you finish your game, can you please leave? And I was like... I am on this team. I, I'm like I'm 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 watching I'm watching this game. I, I don't know what exactly I said, but I I don't think it was as polite as I, as I could have been. But I, I was just like completely shook at the idea that I go to the waiting room. And anyway, he was just like, oh, very very sorry, I didn't realize you were on this team. So okay, like it, it's fine. But yeah, the uh, point is I, I'm staying. Right, I, I'm gonna see how my team does. So I'm watching, and. Yeah, unfortunately for Brandon, uh, basically he manages to actually save the position, but he's got so little time that he can't actually play out his resulting position. I think he was still under a bit of pressure, and he ends up losing. Around this point, uh, Joel 
manages to pull off a checkmate against his opponent. And what he did really well was unlike, you know, uh, you know, some of the previous rounds where he was playing like a turtle, he was moving his pieces a bit faster, he was staying like competitive on the clock, and he was I could see that, you know, he was confident and focused. Like he wasn't he wasn't like, you know, uh, kind of nervously playing his moves against a strong player, right? So, so this was really, really, uh, this was great, uh, great uh, growth within the tournament, and he got his win. So at this moment, we are 2-1 up in, in this event. And uh, the thing is, if we lose the last game, we draw the match, and it's not the end of the world, but probably we're not going to get like uh, on the podium, right? Because there are some other teams that are like close hot on our tails, like I think uh, the teams playing on table two, even the teams, teams playing on table three, uh, are definitely in for a chance of like winning a prize. So basically, we had to, we had to like her captain, Hakeem, needed to draw or win in order to clutch the match. And what I wanted to show you guys, actually, was the final few moments of, of this game. Okay, so, so this, is, this, is the, this is the starting moment of, of this most insane time scramble. Um, wait, how can I, let me, let me get rid of, let me get rid of that. Okay, I, I want to make this like as, as good a cinematic experience uh, for you guys as possible. So yeah, basically, um, both Captain Hakeem and his opponent are down to like probably a minute left at each point, at, at this point. And, you know, I was losing my, my mind over this because at this moment, like, the, the, the importance of the objectivity of the moves becomes less and less and more about who's, who's going to flag, right? <clears throat> and at this moment, I realize that Black has a threat. Black is threatening to, to play the move Rook D3 check, uh, forking the king and the bishop. So Hakeem here plays a very natural move. He plays king e4, but the opponent, uh, obviously being a prodigious, talented junior, uh, doesn't hesitate to play this. Now, <laughs> I don't know if you guys all caught that, but basically Hakeem uh, sighs. Like he, I don't know, probably even swears, I, I don't even know. But yeah, he's definitely like, oh man, because he realizes that crap, his bishop is trapped. Right, his bishop is trapped and he can't block with the rook because the pawn will take. Now, when I was watching this live, I was like, shit. Hakeem is going to fully tilt. Uh, he's going to collapse. He's going to be like, I lost the bishop. And he's going he's gonna to tank like 10, 10, 15 seconds on this move. And that's going to cost the game. Because 10, 15 seconds, when you've got a minute left, when you're going to be down a piece, that is lights out. Now, let's watch that again carefully. And watch how quickly the recovery is at this moment, Okay. So king e4 played, rook d3 played immediately, Hakeem realizes the mistake, and the lock in. You see it in his eyes. He locks in, and he pushes that pawn. And at this moment, okay, the opponent doesn't have time to calculate what this pawn is doing, so he takes the free bishop, and the pawn pushes instantly. And you suddenly see that despite being down a piece, white has got tremendous play. Now, objectively speaking, who the hell knows who's better here? But it doesn't matter. The side with the play is the one who's going to be putting on all the pressure. And at this moment, let's see what, what happens. So now the opponent is the one tanking, suddenly realizing, I mean, the emotional roller coaster for that opponent to feel like he's uh, played a game-winning move to win a piece, and now is having to fight for maybe even a draw, that is huge with, with a minute left, especially given the pressure on these two guys' shoulders. Like, the whole match... Uh, is dependent on this result, right? Now, I don't know if you guys saw, but there was a very, very quick hand gesture from uh, Hakim, and Hakim actually offered a draw here. Now, okay, it's unfortunate that the opponent uh, was in the process of moving, just as Hakim said this, uh, but it shows that Hakim is, you know, alert. He's thinking about, thinking about the draw. He realizes that the team needs a draw. I mean, you get some, some team competitions where even strong players, they're just thinking about themselves. They don't care about the team. They're just thinking about, like, you know, their, their own result. And they haven't even looked at how the team is doing. So, you know, this, uh, this, is, a, this is a serious uh, team. We're, we're, we're in this together. And Hakeem is looking for the draw. So 
the opponent declines, pushes the pawn, and he's gonna he's gonna touch the rook, right? Because the rook's attacked. But then he pushes the pawn. What a crazy move, right? He sacrifices the rook with the intention that he's gonna promote with the queen, where the queen is going to prevent the opponent's pawn from promoting. What a crazy tactic under pressure. And Hakim gets his queen ready. Exactly what he should do. The opponent follows suit. White promotes to a queen. White takes the rook. Oh my god, he drops the piece. And now he gets behind the pawn. Yeah, Black's, Black's rook uh, accidentally went to the wrong square. So yeah, respect to the opponent for fixing, fixing the rook. Um, and now he pushes the pawn. And this is where the panic sets in. At this moment, Black cannot find a way to keep hold of a pawn and promote it. And the problem is, if the rook just stays here and, uh, you know, guards the pawn, well, then Black is playing with an inactive rook, or White's king is on the hunt to go grab some pawns. So, in fact, in this position, even though Black is up a pawn, and Black has this beautiful passed pawn on Saint Frank, I actually think White has the advantage, because White has the stronger activity in this position. He's got a perfectly placed rook and a more active king. Now, this moment, um, Black decides uh, to sacrifice uh, the queen uh, just to get some activity, gives a check, which is probably a mistake, and this is some crazy moment, right? At this moment, here, white brings the rook down, threatening rook h8 checkmate. As a result, black must play rook h7, king h7, to stop it. And at this moment, it's incredible, because Hakim realizes that he doesn't need to play for the win. All he needs is a draw. And look at this. And the, the, the threefold repetition is made. Incredible. With both sides, I think they had less than 10 seconds on the clock. And I don't know if you had someone, like, uh, clap their hand at the end. I mean, probably there are still games going on. I, I, didn't, give a, I didn't give a crap. Like, I, I, had to, I had so much tension in my body from watching this, this, this game. I, I just had to release it in, in, some, in some way. And, and what a game. What a game. To, to be able to find this perpetual is, is unbelievable. And... Yeah, the opponent could do nothing, right? He, he's stuck in this, uh, this, this repetition. Uh, so either he allows himself to get checkmated or, or, he, or he, yeah, lose, loses. Uh, or, or he accepts the repetition. And with that draw, uh, Hakim clutches the match, which is just absolutely huge, right? Because, you know, Hakim was the captain. Hakim was on this bad run of form. Uh, Hakim had all the pressure on his shoulders. And given that pressure was his, you know, biggest weakness going, like, experiencing in this tournament, right? The fact that he was able to overcome it and clutch against a player who I, I forgot to mention, this opponent was on five out of five at this moment in the tournament. Can you imagine? The guy's on five out of five. You're having to play this guy with all the pressure on your shoulders. That's your biggest weakness. And you managed to pull through. Incredible, incredible. I think to me, like, that's, that's honestly like the, the highlight of, of the event. Like, I think it's the most impressive, impressive moment. Like, absolutely incredible, incredible scenes. Uh... And yeah, with that, uh, we managed to win. And in the end, he managed to get his opponent in a mating net, where basically the only way to avoid a mating net is to repeat, uh, and therefore they repeated. And it was a draw, and they both had like 10 seconds uh, left. So it was absolutely clutch, and this whole time, you know, I've been telling the boys to like, um, you know, play faster, play faster, it's 20-0, it's all about the clock. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's the story. So, so we managed to win this uh, last round, and actually that meant uh, we won all of our rounds, except for one round. Uh, and I thought that meant we won the overall, but unfortunately, uh, we actually come second on tiebreak. So yeah, unfortunately, we, we, don't, we don't get the, uh, get the first place, but second place is absolutely huge. I mean, our team, like I had 1950, uh, our board two had uh, 1700, board three had 1700, board four had 1600. And we're playing like guys who were like 2200, you know, and then there's one team um, who had like, uh, you know, FM, 2300 FM on board three, like Ivan. <laughs> so it's crazy, like, like the power we came second. So yeah, just amazingly proud. And, and the other thing as well, is like our team, we had a team of eight because we had like um, four plushies to go with each of us. And I think like the extra motivation was just really, really good. So yeah. We managed, uh, we managed to get, um, uh, get get awarded the trophy. I had to bring one of the plushies up, and you know, captain captain's plushie gets gets the uh, gets to uh, join in on the photo. Um, we we also got uh, some 
some uh, Malaysian ringgit as well, uh, which we had to. We had. I, I was. I was determined to make a make a money shot. Like, yeah, good good money. Um, and yeah, this is this is us with all of our plushies. So I, I like this chicken. I mean, at first. You know, I had the suspicion that it might be cursed, right? I lost my round one, I lost my round two. And going into... No, I drew my round one, lost my round two. But uh, going into round three, I wasn't going to take uh, take the plushie. But then I then I felt like, you know, I, I have to... I have to, I have to stick through it. Like I, I can't, I can't give up on it now. And I won round three, I won round four, I won round five, and I won round six. So uh, the strength of the plushie definitely uh, uh, recovered my recovered my chest. And yeah, I think this is just such a legendary photo. Like all of the certificates, all of the medals, all of the trophies, and all of the plushies. Like holy crap, amazing. And uh, yeah, like throughout this video, probably I'm going to do some edits where you get to see some extra clips. Um, and uh, yeah, I have to shout out uh, Ellie for uh, taking a lot of these photos. She is an international arbiter, uh, helped run the event along with the organizers. I wish I had some photos of the organizers as well because they did a fantastic job uh, given that this is our first um, rapid, uh, serious rapid championships that they've organized. So yeah, uh, kudos, kudos to them. Uh, and yeah, on that note, uh, I think I'm going to call an end to this video. So this is how, uh, you know, um, this underdog team managed to defy all odds and, um, you know, get the second place. And I mean, I, 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 should, I should add as well that um, I, I forgot to mention that, uh, yeah, we, we ended up narrowly missing uh, the first place uh, just on tiebreak, actually. We, we actually uh, ended up losing to uh, this guy's team, uh, Nicholas's team. Um, he, Nicholas is a FIDE master and he was on the team that beat our team, you know, the one with uh, Ivan on board three. So they managed to, so it was, it was very, it was very uh, uh, exciting. But yeah, no, uh, amazing, amazing event, amazing tournament. And yeah, actually, uh, I'm at some point today going to go through some of uh, the extra positions, uh, not only from the team rapid, but from the individual rapid and individual blitz, which takes a whole other video to get into the details. So, so probably I'll just, um, you know, discuss, discuss how that went on stream. Uh, but yeah, that is how my Malaysian team rapid went. Uh, and yeah, up for plushies. Like, what, what an amazing... <laughs> Uh, event and yeah hope you guys enjoyed that recap of of how it went so thank you guys all for tuning in for that i hope you learned something and yeah if you're gonna take home one chess uh insight from from this video i mean it's really the the, the Alaska quote right the most natural moves are the moves you have to be most careful about like not only did my first round opponent make those mistakes as a result of this i also made mistakes as a result of this blundering a stalemate um kevin mohan also made this mistake of um you know, uh, blundering uh, this, this fork. Uh, and all of these uh, mistakes are all based on making natural intuitive moves that are calcul uh, tactically flawed, right? And it's not like we can't see the tactics. It's because we are, we are uh, misguided uh, because the, the move looks so intuitively nice that we don't think tactically. And that's the real problem. That's the real problem, which is why Laska, very, very early on, hundreds of years ago, already alluded to this fact that, uh, you know, this is a potential problem that you have to be, be aware of. So on that note, guys, thank you guys for tuning in. And yeah, see you guys in a stream or in the next video sometime. Okay, bye-bye. When are you making your YouTube channel? <laughs> yeah. uh, you saw the shout out, right? Oh, what's your, what's your excuse? He's a I bad haven't team played. Team. No, I need to work on the chemistry, guys. Work on the chemistry. Oh, I'll do it myself, but not with him because he's bad teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah, that's